Ladies and gentlemen, honored guests, there are voices in my head and there are voices in my heart. And at times they're the same voice, at times they're separate. In George Steiner's remarkable book, A Reader, George indeed writes, when we attempt to describe the Holocaust, the language breaks. What intellectual vigor, discipline, stamina, determination, let alone days of painful research, must Saul Friedlander have mined in order to write his massive tomb, The Years of Extermination, 1933 to 1945. One of the great voices in my heart is Simon Wiesenthal, whom I first met in Vienna, of all places, in 1988. I visited his office where he gestured to his mass of files and said, blood turned to ink. Later, over lunch at the Schwarzenberg Hotel, he told me of the liberation by Americans of Mauthausen. He said, all the liberated prisoners had a flag of their home nation, but we did not have a Jewish flag. Some of the prisoners tore up their blue and white striped shirts and somehow they fashioned a Jewish flag which they were able to wave for a few precious moments after which they collapsed in exhaustion. It was their final act. He paused in telling this story and wiped openly wept tears with his hand thus. He, in his own grief, helped the rest of us to grieve. Grief is an essential part of healing, and to this day, I personally do not believe that Europe allowed herself to grieve. I first met Elie Wiesel, in Berlin, in the wings of a great theater. Both of us were invited to speak. As he walked on stage to address the Berlin audience, I felt their collective heartbeat stop, their breath hold. These were Elie Wiesel's opening words, and I was on stage with him when he uttered them. My dear young Germans, I know it is very difficult being you. An English poet of the Victorian era took it upon himself to write a forgiveness with, I suspect, a glass of sherry in one hand and a pen in the other. If we could read the secret history of our enemies, we should find in each other's person's life, sorrow and suffering enough to disarm all hostility. Let me counter Mr. Longfellow with a simple statement from a young German philosopher. We measure everything by Auschwitz. A voice I listen to repeatedly is General Axel von den Buscher. We Germans, and this could be universal, but he said, we Germans will move into the 21st century with an indigestible lump of history that must not be forgotten, may never be forgiven, and will never be understood. So Thomas Keneally leaves his book signing 
in Beverly Hills, and he goes in search of a new briefcase. He walks into Poldek Pfefferberg's store in Beverly Hills to purchase one. Poldek, a Schindler survivor. Poldek and Mila, with whom I spent a lot of time. He was naturally curious, and he asked Thomas what he did for a living. I'm a writer, answered Thomas. And thus began an extraordinary cooperation between Poldek Pfefferberg, Thomas Keneally, Steven Zalian, and Steven Spielberg. Thomas Keneally, who said, in my presence, Europe committed suicide in 1933. This list is an absolute good. The list is life. All around its margins lies the gulf. I have had this brilliant couplet of poetry quoted to me as far afield as the Canary Islands by a young woman with tears in her eyes. Yes, the language breaks, but that unique combination of rage and poetry reached someone, reaches millions. I arrived on Dear Stephen's set one morning in a rage, having defended one of my Israeli colleagues from a violently anti-Semitic attack, a German-speaking Pole who attacked my friend publicly in a bar in a five-star hotel in Krakow. I told Stephen I was in a rage. Then we must use it. We must use your rage, said Stephen. I carried a photograph of Anne Frank in my pocket, which sustained me throughout the shoot of Schindler's List, along with my darling Stephen and my wonderful cast. I used to pull the photograph out of my pocket, and I used to say, I'm doing this for you. Later in Amsterdam, Miep Kies made me coffee in her Amsterdam apartment, and whilst we chatted under the beautiful portrait of Anne on her wall, she recounted to me, to me, how she found the diary, having sheltered and defended the Franks for years. She, she told the story in the most animated of terms. After the attic had been evacuated by Silberbar and his men, Meep came up to the attic and she saw the chaos, the scattered pages on the floor. And I saw Meep do this. She enacted it for me. She said, look, look, there is the diary of Anne. There is the diary of Anne. And that's how it began. And the world heard Anne. Voices in my heart. I loved Meep. I spent time with uh, Jacqueline Van Marsen, uh, Anne's best friend at school. But what remains with me is a man who worked with Otto Frank after the war. He waited outside my trailer. He wanted to meet me. And I left my trailer, uh, costumed and made up as Otto. And the man opened his arms when he saw me and cried, there is my friend. There is my friend. And this, dear members of my profession, is our task. That unspeakably difficult, though it seems, when a yellow star appears on the screen, we must make audiences make that connection, make that realization. There is my friend. To the members of my profession, Kate, my wife, the actors, directors, writers, producers, agents, let me say this, when your motives are pure, 
the angels will come. When you walk into that office with your precious manuscript under your arm, your story from those years of extermination, be empowered by this. Think of the millions of lost stories, the silenced stories. Shakespeare's Hamlet's last words to his Horatio, his friend, and draw thy breath in pain to tell my story. Let me conclude with the words of my two dear friends, Elie Wiesel and Simon Wiesenthal. Elie. Let us tell tales, all the rest can wait, all the rest must wait. Let us tell tales, that is our primary obligation. Commentaries will have to come later, lest they replace or becloud what they mean to reveal. Let us tell tales so as to remember how vulnerable man is when faced with overwhelming evil. Let us tell tales so as not to allow the executioner to have the last word. The last word belongs to the victim. It is up to the witness to capture it, shape it, transmit. And Simon Wiesenthal. Simon was a dad to me. He was a dad. And it was Simon who told me this. When I pass to the other side and meet all those who perished, I will be able to say, I never forgot you. I thank you for giving me permission to be a witness. Thank you. <laughs>